Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy. This is Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies. And today we're going to talk about something that's been in the news a lot, but I don't think really has been explained sufficiently. That is something called CBP-1. That's an app, a smartphone app. CBP is Customs and Border Protection, the part of DHS that deals with border issues, both Border Patrol and the legal crossing points. And so the CBP came up with this app called CBP-1, and it's been in the news a lot with regard to the president's management of the border, if management is even the word for it. And I thought it would be worth getting a little bit into what this app is, where it came from, what's being done with it. And to talk about that, we brought in Art Arthur. Andrew Arthur is the way you'll see his byline in his frequent blog posts. And he's written a good deal on this. And so uh, I figured we'd have him in studio and talk about it. Art, thanks for schlepping to our studio in D.C. from your uh, Fortress of Solitude in North Carolina. So where'd CBP-1 come from? It wasn't originally intended to bring illegal aliens into the United States, was it? No, and it's important to note the fact that whenever you see the federal government talk about CBP-1, it always has that little trademark thing above it. Because the federal government has actually... (laughs) <laughs> Trademark the uh, CBP-1 mobile application available on the App Store and also Android app on Google Play if anybody wants to download yeah, it. Y'all need to download that. Yeah. Take a look at it. But yeah, so it started back in late October of 2020. And the original purpose of the CBP-1 app was to allow legitimate travelers to schedule appointments at the ports of entry before they came into the United States. Airplane owners, bus companies, brokers, forwarders, carriers could schedule appointments at the ports of entry so that they could facilitate and expedite the inspection process. And all of this grew out of COVID because they wanted to reduce the amount of time that those legitimate travelers to the United States were spending face-to-face with a CBP officer or CBPO at the ports of entry. It's important to note the fact, and there's a lot of confusion about this, that between the ports of entry, Border Patrol controls the border. That's their job. But at the ports of entry, that duty is assumed at the Office of Field Operations, OFO, at Customs and Border Protection, CBP. And just for people who don't follow this, port of entry, the first time I heard it, I was like, well, but there's places where there's no water too. In other words, port here does not mean port in the usual sense. What it means is just any legal crossing point into the United States, including at an international airport inside the country, as well as at border facilities. But any place that you legally cross into the United States is kind of a port of entry, right? Yes. Any lawful crossing point into the United States is a port of entry, and it gets even more confusing if you want to. There are certain pre-clearance spots abroad that are United States ports of entry. When you show up at the airport in Nassau, the Bahamas, you walk into a room that's got American flags and a uh, picture of Joe Biden. That is the U.S. boundary, even though it isn't a foreign country. So, yeah. I think I've done the same thing in the Netherlands, maybe. And also, I remember on a flight to Canada from Boston, I was screened by Canadian Customs in Boston. So the point is, you don't have to do it once you get to their country. Anyway, the point is, I wasn't trying to get you off course, but, but port but no, of entry it, means a way you a legal crossing point into the United States. Right. And it actually goes to a very important point, you know, why we have those pre-clearance abroad, why we have the CBP kiosk, the officers in blue with the kiosks at international airports is because that is a way to screen legitimate travelers to the United States. Right. To ensure that, you know, people who have all their documents in order don't pose a risk the United States are coming here for a legitimate purpose. So this is a key part of our border security. Okay, so CBP-1 was developed during COVID, basically so that legal crossers wouldn't be breathing on DHS officers a lot. In other words, sort of try to minimize the transmission of COVID, which obviously probably didn't work, but at the time it seemed like a good idea. So what has it turned into? We need to go back a little bit to... 2022 to the last few months of 2022, when Title 42 was still in effect. At the time that Title 42 was still in effect, there were a handful of 
would-be migrants who would show up at the ports of entry rather than entering the United States illegally and attempting to get in. And most of those were returned or were, you know, handled in a certain way. So they would come to the port of entry to what? To claim asylum or something? To claim asylum. Right. Okay. Uh, Because, of course, there is this thought that's actually been propagated by the Biden administration that somehow showing up at a port of entry without proper documents is different than entering the United States illegally without proper documents. It's not. The same inspection system takes place. The same grounds of inadmissibility apply. You're equally as illegally present in the United States if you jump the line, as we used to say, or you know, cross the boundaries of the United States between the ports, as you are if you show up at the ports of entry without proper documents. But what was happening, you know, in the latter months of 2022 was non-governmental organizations would come up with lists of people who they thought for some humanitarian reason should be exempt from being expelled under Title 42, even though they otherwise would. Those individuals were scheduled for appointments at the ports of entry to go in, you know, present their humanitarian case and then generally be paroled into the United States. And they used CBP for that schedule. So they didn't use uh, Customs and Border Protection ran that, but they didn't use the CBP-1 app. This was strictly an agreement between Customs and Border Protection and the NGOs. Okay. And in fact, Todd Benzman, our dogged researcher, danger ranger, as I call him, (laughs) who, you know, goes over there, actually reported on this. He was the first person to report on this back in November of 2022. Then on January the 5th, the White House announced that, quote, when Title 42 eventually lifts, non-citizens located in central and northern Mexico seeking to enter the United States lawfully through a U.S. port of entry have access to the CBP-1 mobile application for scheduling an appointment to present themselves for inspection and to initiate a protection claim instead of coming directly to a port of entry to wait. This new feature will significantly reduce wait times and crowds at U.S. ports of entry and allow for safe, orderly, and humane processing. Well, there are a lot of misstatements, you know, in that excerpt that I just read to you. That was from a January 5th fact sheet titled, quote, Biden-Harris administration announces new border enforcement actions, close quote. There actually were no enforcement actions. They were contained in that. It was new actions. They just weren't about enforcement. They just weren't about enforcement. And so, again, the idea was to take the CBP-1 mobile application, which had been developed in October of 2020 for legitimate travelers, and transform it into a method by which aliens who have no proper documents to enter the United States could go to a port of entry and enter the United States. Essentially, schedule their illegal immigration into the United States is kind of what it amounts to. Exactly. And, you know, there are a number of aspects to this. One, you'll hear the Biden administration say that, you know, this cuts the heart out of the smuggling scheme because you don't need a smuggler to get you across the border. If you'll note from the excerpt that I just read to you, you have to be in central or northern Mexico in order to actually access the app to make the appointment at the port of entry, which means that you're going to have to pay a smuggler to get you there. And if you cross, you know, areas that are controlled by uh, cartels, you're still going to have to pay the tax to the cartel in order to pass through their territory. So the same abuses that even Vice President Biden used to talk about when he was serious about border security that are inflicted on aliens, illegal migrants to the United States by their smugglers, those still all happen. This hasn't done anything to the smuggling scheme except for the last part of it, which is the physical entry into the United States. Now, I mean, arguably it incentivizes more of that kind of abuse because if it's easier to get in or we're luring people to come, more people are going to end up paying smugglers. Exactly. And you and I have both written extensively about the concept of the attractive nuisance. That is a tort concept that applies to people who lure others into a dangerous situation. Generally, children, the classic example is you leave a ladder on the side of your house all night. Some kid might, you know, find the ladder, climb up it, and fall off your roof, and you're going to be liable. And or a swimming pool that you don't put a fence around. Or a around. swimming pool that you don't put a fence around. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, this is creating that sort of attractive nuisance. Then, after that January 5th announcement, the Biden administration issued another announcement. In this announcement, they said, 
they're going to change the asylum rules. If you enter the United States illegally and you didn't apply for asylum in a country that you passed through on your way to the United States, there is going to be a rebuttable presumption that you are not eligible for asylum. This is slightly like, but very different from a similar proposal that the Trump administration had to bar people from receiving asylum if they didn't apply for asylum in a third country that they came to in the United States. It's important to note at this juncture that every country in the Western Hemisphere, with the exception of Cuba and Guyana, you know, grants some form of asylum. There's this concept that everybody has to come to the United States because we're the only country that grants asylum. In reality, the exact opposite is true. And Mexico has its own asylum system. Mexico has its own asylum scheme, which is, you know, supplemented by the United States government and the United Nations. And Mexico is now the third largest country that people apply for asylum to in the world, after only the United States and Germany. Interesting. But the flip side of this rebuttable presumption for people who enter illegally is if you schedule an appointment through the CBP-1 app and you go to the port of entry, your asylum claim is going to be processed under the old rules. Now, this is probably illegal, and the Biden administration probably knows that this distinction is going to be found to be illegal by another court, but it's a nice gloss that they can put on this process of bringing people into the United States. Interesting. Two points on that. First is, and we'll put this in the show notes, another one of our colleagues, Elizabeth Jacobs, wrote about that asylum rule and you know all of the exceptions and loopholes that sort of swallow the rule up. And one of those loopholes, as you suggested, is that even if you didn't apply for asylum in one of the countries you passed through, if you use the CBP-1 app, all is forgiven. You get to apply anyway. Absolutely. And, and again, we could do an entire other podcast and all the exceptions and about how it's truly just. Oh, a let me write that. We'll schedule that one. <laughs> exactly. But and so consequently, there is now a backlog of people in Mexico who are attempting to access one of these appointments at the ports of entry. Probably accidentally, CBP released a couple of months ago that people were waiting for three months in Mexico for their interview appointments under the CBP-1 app. And the reason that I bring that up is the Trump administration had a very effective policy called Remain in Mexico, was formerly called the Migrant Protection Protocols. The Biden administration shut down MPP Remain in Mexico almost immediately after President Biden took office. And the argument that they made was it was too dangerous to make people wait in Mexico for the four months that it would take them to actually have their asylum hearings in the United States. Now, under the CBP-1 app, people are waiting a pretty equivalent period of time in Mexico to go through the ports of entry. And there are a couple of things that if we they know- they didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all. But anyway, go ahead. But yeah, and there are a couple of you know other key points. We don't know a lot about what goes on at the ports of entry. The Biden administration has offered us no visibility into that process. In fact, we don't know how many people who show up at the ports of entry every month the Biden administration allows into the United States because the Office of Field Operations, unlike Border Patrol, doesn't actually publish its mm. release figures. What we do know from published reports is that more than 99 percent, more than 99 percent of all of the people who show up at the ports of entry and schedule an appointment with the CBP-1 app are allowed into the United States. And we also know that from published reports, there have been about 20,000 appointments per month under the CBP-1 app. We also know from a recent CBS News report that that's going to go up to 40,000 people a month. So what you're basically doing is, Mark, you're taking that entire population of would-be illegal migrants, the people that would cross the Rio Grande or would come across the Sonoran Desert or would enter over an Imperial Beach, and you are funneling them all through the ports of entry, which brings me back to the January 5th fact sheet, because it refers to non-citizens, which is their word for aliens, seeking to enter the United States lawfully. Again, there's nothing lawful about the entry of those individuals into the United States. Lawful entry is you apply for a visa, you get a visa, you show up at the port of entry, you get inspected. And, you know, you're probably let in, maybe not, but generally you're going to be let in. Right. 
So this is using words like, you know, lawfully, safe, orderly, and humane as cover for a system that is completely illegal. And it's critical for the listeners to understand because this is one of those things even a lot of people on Capitol Hill don't get. Just because it's a port of entry doesn't make it legal. Right. It's the exact same inspection process. It's the exact same grounds of uh, removability. And CBP is under the same obligation to detain the people who show up illegally without documents at the ports of entry in much the same way that they're under a legal obligation, as Judge uh, T. Kent Weatherell II found in his recent decision in Florida versus United States for people who have entered the United States illegally, found that there is an obligation. It's clear, shall mean shall in the Immigration and Nationality Act when it says those people shall be detained, and the Biden administration is violating that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, is that conceivably, the way they're using CBP-1 for inadmissible aliens, people who aren't, you know, legal crossers just trying to schedule something, the way they're using it, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it could be defended as lawful if they then detained everybody who claimed asylum, if they let them in. It, yeah. Would that be correct? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. It is definitely safer to go through the port of entry than it is to go through the Rio Grande where currents are unpredictable sure. and the river can flood or go through the Sonoran Desert where you could die. There's no doubt about that. It's also more orderly than illegal entry. And the fact is, it's not really more humane. If those individuals were detained, which again is what Congress said is supposed to happen, and it's important to note, Congress said that those people at the ports of entry are supposed to be detained back in 1903. <laughs> right. That law has been in effect for 120 years. It's gone through various reiterations of the Immigration and Nationality Act and remained the same. And yet the Biden administration in 2023 has suddenly discovered that when Congress said, shall it really meant may, and you know, we only do what we can. So yes, and it's important for, you know, not just the listeners and Congress, but also litigants in the various cases that have been brought against the Biden administration's border release policies and the courts themselves to understand there's no difference whatsoever legally between illegal entry through the ports of entry and illegal entry between the ports of entry right. into the United States. So it's, it's still catch and release, basically, is what it amounts to. So I've actually taken to calling it inspect and release. Yeah, okay. Because, you know. This is the port of entry equivalent of the Border Patrol's catch and release. Yes. Right. And, you know, we know that the number of notices to appear, those are the charging documents and removal proceedings that have been issued by CBP, OFO, because they actually do report that statistic, right. has tripled between April of 2022 and April of 2023. Wow. Okay. And that is, a, so it went from, you know, 7,344, I think it was, to more than 24,000 in April. So that's really what's happening. All of those would be migrants. They don't have any right to be in the United States. Maybe they have asylum claims. Maybe they don't. Supreme Court's actually made clear at one decision. Most people uh, who claim asylum don't receive it, and some of those claims are fraudulent. And some people who say they're going to claim asylum and are let in on that basis never end up following through and claiming asylum. Yeah, and in fact, in a recent piece, I broke down the results of the claims, of the asylum claims that people have made at the border. About a third of the people who made asylum claims at the border never filed for asylum. Now, they don't tell us how many of those people didn't show, but probably about another third didn't show in court either. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what the Biden administration is really doing, Mark, is it's taking a system in which people can come to the United States to seek asylum and changing it into a system in which people come to the United States to seek the process of applying for asylum. Right. Because that asylum system you know, the application system going before the courts can take a decade. Those individuals can live and work in the United States for that decade. They can build up the equities that are going to make it impossible for us to actually remove them. Have children and what have you. And right. Have children and whatever. And again, the vast majority, probably, you know, fewer than 20 percent of those individuals are going to be granted asylum. But they're all going to get to come in because the Biden administration isn't doing the one key thing Congress has told it to do, and that is to detain those migrants 
you know, either at the ports or between the ports who have asylum claims. Essentially, if you think about it, the administ- Biden administration is conspiring with illegal immigrants in order to game the asylum system. It's kind of what it amounts to. I mean, yeah, if you think actually, about it, yeah. if you're talking about a conspiracy, the regulator of this conspiracy is actually the Biden administration. Yeah, that's what I mean, right. And again, you know, we talked about the attractive nuisance doctrine. They are encouraging people to come to the United States at their own peril. We know that the rates of physical assault for people smuggled to the United States, more than two thirds of all people who come to the United States illegally are physically assaulted during that journey. And just less than a third of all females are sexually assaulted during that journey. And, you know, these were things that were talked about at length during the Obama-Biden administration. But under the uh, Biden-Harris administration, all of that is forgotten. Right, right. So essentially, I mean, what the CBP-1 app is the tool the administration is using to launder illegal immigration, I think would be a fair way to put it, because they're talking about how this is, that you know, we're converting illegal immigration into legal entry. And as you pointed out, the entry is illegal anyway. But it really is a kind of, uh, it's a laundering tool. And what it reflects is the administration's commitment not to stopping the flow, but to accommodating the flow and to accommodate it in such a way that isn't politically damaging for the administration. Yeah. And, you know, the way that they get away with this or they're attempting to get away with it is to treat this as something different and special and legal. Right. It's not different, special or legal at all. Laundering, it's a form of leisure domain. It's like um, when David Copperfield, the magician, made the Statue of Liberty disappear. It's almost exactly the same thing. They're turning it so that you don't see the Statue of Liberty. It's still there. The law is still the law, and they're still violating the law. So what, I mean, I think we've, you've kind of answered this, but a lot of people have, in fact, objected, saying applying for asylum is legal. And the implication is that these people aren't illegal immigrants because they're applying for asylum. Uh, applying for asylum, of course, is permitted in the law if you're an illegal immigrant, but don't you have to be an illegal immigrant first? You do. And asylum is an exception to the limits that Congress has placed on immigration. And again, there's strict limits, but they're also very generous strict limits. About, you know, in a normal year back before COVID, about 188 million non-immigrants came to the United States every year. About non-immigrant a, means a temporary visa. Temporary visitors. visa, students, yeah. tourists, fiancés, temporary workers, things like that. We admitted about a million lawful permanent residents, green card holders, or we converted the status of old non-immigrants into green card holders, but about a million people, and about a million people naturalized every year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these are not, you know, we are the most generous country when it comes to immigration in the world. And yet the Biden administration wants to exceed those limits and then some by saying they're all asylum seekers. If you read the newspapers and you read the claims that people make, you know, my shop burned down or I came from a poor village or there was a lot of crime. None of those are valid asylum claims. And the one thing that we know from history, from historical reference is when you actually do the detention part, many, many, many factors of fewer people entering the United States illegally. But you also, you know, weed out those bad asylum claims. Most of the people that are willing to come to the United States, be detained, knowing that they're going to be detained to get asylum, the number of good claims goes up. Right, right. So, you know, the Biden administration, you know, is perverting that program and it hurts not just the American workers, U.S. sovereignty, whatever else you want to say. It adversely affects those legitimate asylum seekers. I was a judge in a detained court and right now the detained courts are completing asylum cases in 42 days. If you have a legitimate asylum claim, if you show up, you're going to walk out with asylum in 42 days. So this is immigration courts in a detention center. In a detention clarify, center. Right. In a detained Because the person's facility. right there. You don't have to go look for them. They can't not show up. They're right there. They're right there. And if you've got a legitimate asylum claim, you're willing to you know, stick around for 42 days to get your claim because that not only regularizes your status in the United States, but it also enables you to then petition for your relatives abroad who might be in exactly the same sort of danger that you were in. And we actually see this happen quite right, a bit. Right. But because of this perversion of the asylum scheme, 
you know, taking advantage of, you know, the Biden administration is allowing people to take advantage of our generosity. We're now stretching out the period of time that it takes to receive asylum. On average, it's about, you know, more than four years that, wow. you know, for the whole process. This is not in a detention facility. These are the people that they let go. People not detained right. takes about, you know, more than four years on average. And a lot of those cases take 10 years or more. Right. And those are, you know, that's time that people with legitimate claims sort of flail around in the system waiting to get the chance to talk to a judge. Interesting. So you didn't work in CBP and sort of manage uh, cross-border traffic, but does CBP-1 have value if you take out the use of it to foster illegal immigration as this administration is doing? It seems like it still could be a useful thing if it's used properly. Yeah. And I, you know, I will note that the inspection process really hasn't changed in you know, almost 150 years. And I was an associate general counsel at the former Immigration and Naturalization Service on the enforcement team. I had, you know, jurisdiction over the ports and would answer port questions all the time. Nothing's really changed in that process. Mm -hmm. CBP-1 app, mobile application trademark, is actually a great tool if you're talking about legitimate travelers because, you know, we get bottlenecks at the ports all the time. Right. Produce is coming from Mexico. Goods are flowing south to Mexico or to Canada. We want to facilitate that traffic as quickly as possible. And just, I don't mean to interrupt, but well, I do. The facilitating the traffic, in a sense, if it's used properly, actually improves security. Because when the lines get too long, they end up doing line flushing, they call it, where they just sort of wave a whole bunch of people through to move things along. And those people aren't inspected properly very often. So in a sense, it could be used to improve security. It's just being used for the opposite purposes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you bring up a critical point that I don't want people to miss. We, again, CBS News has reported that they're going to boost the number of interview slots for CBP-1 non-lawful travelers right. to 40,000. A month. A month. That's going to slow the legitimate traffic at the ports because you're going to have to take CBP officers, the guys in the blue, and the women in the blue, and you're going to have to send them over here to interview 40,000 non-legitimate travelers a month. While trucks full of produce are sitting there are sitting idling there. Uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the booths. So, you know, exactly the national security uh, danger that you're talking about is heightened because they're going to become overworked. They're going to have lines that get backed up. They're not going to be able to send people to secondary inspection where, you know, the real work takes place when there's somebody that we have a question about. All those people are just going to come in. This is a national security vulnerability of the highest order. It's almost as if the Biden administration lives in a September 10th world. Yeah, almost. Uh, not even almost. I think that's pretty much we've forgotten what happened 22 years ago. We're going to leave it there. Thanks, Art, for explaining this. I hope uh, we cleared up some of this CBP-1, uh, some of the confusion about it. I actually learned some stuff. I think it's important for people to understand that this app is not illegitimate in itself. It's being used illegitimately by this administration. Um, so um, we will see how this goes. I assume that that 40000 a month new cap that they had announced, because it was 30000 a month before at least a cap. And so it's up to 40,000. The enormous amount of demand that exists, I think it was that same CBS News story, we'll put it in the show notes, said that for one of the other uses of CBP-1, one of the other illegal immigration uses, specifically for people from Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti, who have no right, they're all illegal immigrants too, that 1.5 million people have put in requests to be sponsors for those illegal immigrants. And I think it's partly in response to that surge of demand for illegal immigrants that they've increased this arbitrary limit of 40000 a month. I mean, they're just making it up. And I expect it's going to increase uh, if they reassign people and have more, you know, more capacity to do the processing of these people. They're going to increase it more. I mean, I can, there's there's no basis in the number. They're just making it up. So there's no reason it couldn't be 100000 a month. Uh, and, you know, who was it? Was it Everett Dirksen who said a billion here, a billion there? It starts to add up. Well, you know, you get 40,000, 50,000 illegal immigrants a month and you up that and double it and it begins to add up. So anyway, we may have you back to talk about it at that point. 
But in the meantime, thanks for coming in. And like I said, I learned something. I hope the listeners learned something too. Thank you, Mark. And finally, a bit of news that relates directly to what Art and I were just talking about. The uh, Homeland Security Department released some numbers about what's been going on at the border since the end of Title 42. And they're basically, you know, declaring mission accomplished, that what they're doing is working as expected. And the factoid that they are hoping that will be repeated is that the apprehensions between the ports of entry at the border by the Border Patrol have decreased by more than 70% since the end of Title 42. They were offering numbers from May 12th to June 2nd. And I go over all this in a blog post at National Review called Mission Accomplished at the Border. So the point is that's supposed to be great, right? The Border Patrol apprehensions have gone down. I have no doubt that's true. The thing is they do also further down report how many more people have come through the ports of entry using the CBP-1 app that we were just talking about. And when you add up the numbers, in fact, the level of illegal immigration at the border hasn't really changed very much. If you average it out to a monthly rate, it came out to something like 176,000 a month. That's not for a particular month. That's the daily numbers that they reported, averages, multiply it by 30. Well, that's lower than some months under Biden, higher than other months, and dramatically higher than anything we'd seen before. And as Obama's own DHS secretary said, anything more than a thousand illegal immigrants a day overwhelms the system. And what the administration is crowing about and pointing to as a success is close to 6,000 illegal immigrants a day. It's just that a lot of them, and I assume they're hoping an increasing share, are funneled through the ports of entry using the CBP-1 app so that the administration can say they're entering legally when, in fact, as we just discussed, there's nothing legal about it. The administration is free to use the CBP app to schedule foreigners coming to the border. As Art had pointed out, it was developed for bus companies and others to um, make traffic kind of smooth out the traffic. Uh, The thing is that when people come to the border using this CBP-1 app and say they fear persecution or want asylum or what have you, the administration is obliged by law to detain them during the entire course of their proceedings. Instead, they simply ignore that legal mandate and let people go. And so what we're going to see is more and more people coming through the ports of entry with this CBP-1 app and being illegally released because they have no right to be in the United States. We're also, however, going to see increasing numbers of people coming the old-fashioned way between the ports of entry. As our colleague Todd Benzman has reported, he wrote a piece in the New York Post based on reporting he just did last week at the border that the part of border he visited, which is Del Rio, Texas, all kinds of illegal immigrants who brought children with them are basically getting impatient with the wait for a CBP-1 appointment. They're just crossing the river anyway, and the Border Patrol is just letting them go. So this is one more premature announcement of success at the border by the Biden administration. The announcement itself is not really a success when you actually understand what the numbers are, but the numbers are going to get worse even than what they're reporting here. So uh, a piece I wrote, I laid this out called Mission Accomplished at the Border? Question mark. We have an excerpt at our website, cis.org, that has a link. We'll take you straight to it if you want to just go straight there. That's it for this episode of Parsing Immigration Policy. This is Mark Krikorian, your host, Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies, and I hope you tune in next week. 